Welcome back to Bread and Butter, everybody, where we're serving up the basics for Hearthstone improvement in episode 56. As always, I am joined by my co-host Tito. Tito, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, Doc. Happy New Year. We missed you last week. How was your New Year? It was it was good. It was spent with uh, friends and family back home. But the guest of honor tonight, MTC. MTC, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. How about you guys yourselves? It's, it's cool. I couldn't, I mean... I couldn't ask for it being going much better, to be honest. Love it. And so MTC, what have you been up to in the world of Hearthstone? Uh, grinding ladder. <laughs> Pretty much just that. Fantastic. Nice. Anything particular? Um, I've been playing uh, the Dragon Druid lately. Um, I feel like, yeah, it's just really strong right now and it counters Rogue. So <laughs> it feels really good. It's uh, probably not my favorite deck to be grinding as far as uh you know maybe skill expression stuff like that but it works it gets the job done and uh yeah just for climbing it's been really good fantastic how about yourself doc um i didn't play any hearthstone while i was away um i was gone for a week but that week was extremely busy i drove all along the western side of washington the entire week um from Seattle to basically Portland wow. and places in between. Um, so I, I put on almost 600 miles, I think, on the rental car that I had. <laughs> it was uh, it was a lot of driving. So unfortunately, I didn't get to play any Hearthstone. How about yourself, Tito? Well, did you at least make the joke you're going to Portland with Cortland? No, because uh, unfortunately she had to stay home. Oh, that's a bummer. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Anyway, um, I have been playing a lot of Hearthstone. Um, I had my match against Ron Mexico this week for THL. Uh, You know, former former member, former guest on the show, and actually future guest on the show. Um, We're going to have him on again pretty soon. We just talked about that. But I sadly lost 0-3. I mostly went with the Naga Priest because that was matchup. The matchup grid told me that's what I needed to play. And it was it was tough, but he's a good player, and it was fun. But I spent a lot of time playing um, some fun decks like Nature Shaman, and Nature Shaman is not an easy deck to play. So I've been really putting some time into to, to try to nail down the nuances of that because it's maybe not a great ladder deck. I mean, it's okay, but it's definitely good in competition. So I want to I want to improve upon that. But um, you you started with this doc. What have you been doing outside of Hearthstone? Yeah, so I went on uh, a vacation back home, and so back home for me is Washington State. Um, primary reason for the trip is it's it's been about a year, a little over a year since I went back home, and my niece is like almost 16 months old now. Um, so she's just growing like crazy, and she can she was walking and saying a couple words while I was down there, and the last time she could do nothing but eat, sleep, and poop. Um, but yeah, it's just. It was just crazy. It was a super fun time. Uh, had spent New Year's with friends I hadn't seen in like th- three, four years since before I moved down here. Um, saw some family I didn't get to see the last time I went back. Uh, it was it was busy. Like I said, I did a lot of driving, trying to meet as many people as I possibly could. Um, but it was it was a good time. It was awesome to see everybody. Um, I saw everybody I I wanted to, but didn't feel like I spent enough time. Uh, And I always felt guilty leaving and the trip didn't last long enough for as long as I had the trip planned. Um, Had some fun rental car issues uh, to start the trip, but those got fixed. Uh, When I came back, uh, worked for two days and then um, unfortunately we had a funeral to go to uh, yesterday. Um, But we also had one of Corton's brothers had it like a dance recital. So he does like competition, like ballroom kind of dance. Um, so they had, it was like a showcase of all the, the different studios in the area. Um, and they had a couple judges there. One of the judges was on season two of dancing with the stars. Um, that was pretty cool. And they just gave them feedback after each of their performances to get them ready for the competition season, which starts up uh, later this month. Um, and we got to see him do a solo with him and his girlfriend and they were phenomenal. It was, uh, they were very, very fun to watch. They're both pretty strong dancers. 
Um, and it makes me miss when I did dance when I was younger in like elementary and middle school. Um, but it was just fun to be in that kind of environment again. And then uh, played some commander as well. I've been doing a, playing a lot of commander with Matt at arms and some people from the Squelch discord and Cortland's other brother uh, comes over a couple times a week and we play a couple games of commander. So that's uh, that's what I've been doing in under 30 minutes this time, Tito. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> what have you been doing MTC? Uh, I have to follow that up. Um, well, I, I'm pretty all in on Hearthstone, so I've done uh, just about nothing outside of Hearthstone. Uh, but yeah, pretty much what my day consists of. My, uh, my days are structured around Hearthstone and trying to complete uh, a goal that I have set in mind, uh, which might be obvious if you read my my username. But um, I, I work out. I, uh, I do hang out with my grandparents here and there. We, we just take walks and, uh, you know, maybe help them out with projects, stuff like that. Um, and uh yeah, honestly, that's it. It's pretty much eat, sleep, play Hearthstone, and uh, get a workout in. <laughs> and for me, it's been pretty. It's been pretty quiet. We have just started back up with school for the uh, the, the kid, and he's starting up Taekwondo again next week. It's it's just been you know the general getting back into the swing of things after we finally we get we took down the holiday stuff today, which is kind of a relief. It's like you get space back all of a sudden. There, there's room to move around. And it's like kind of the finality of the season and you get to move on. But outside of that, it hasn't been much. Uh, me and my kids were playing uh, Minecraft today. We were playing last couple days. Uh, I think it's called Skyblock. So it's a, it's a weird mode where you have a map and all you have is like like a four by four block like of dirt and cobblestone or whatever. And then a tree in a crate that has like a block of ice and a bucket or something. And that's pretty much it. And then you have to kind of build out from there and get to it. There's another Island somewhere you can try to get into the nether and there's this whole thing. So it, it's a little different than just having all the resources. You have limited resources and you have to figure out what you got to do. You have lava too. So it's been fun. So it's a little huh. different. I'm enjoying that. Nice. Um, but you know what I'm, I also enjoy actually. So we didn't say his full name. Our guest, we call him MTC, but his name is actually Masters Tour Champion 2024. So, Doc, <laughs> I, I think we need to get to know somebody like that a little better. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Uh, so, first off, what got you started in gaming and how did you find Hearthstone? Um, so, gaming would have began with uh, <clears throat> uh, Warcraft 3, actually, was the first game I ever played. Uh, and I absolutely love that game. Uh, it's a real time strategy game if nobody's ever played it. Um, and it's really, really hard and difficult to play, um, to, and to play well. I was never that good or competitive, uh, with it. But then after that, I just kind of did the bro stuff, uh, Call of Duty here and there. Um, and then, yeah, I found Hearthstone later on. Yeah, probably Sunken City expansion was when I started playing Hearthstone and just fell oh, wow. out absolutely in love with the game it was uh definitely the game for me heck yeah um so why did you decide to name yourself master's first champion 2024 and what do people who don't um want to say that all the time typically call you <laughs> well my name is max so you're more than free to uh to call me max but mtc works pretty well too um okay and uh, yeah, the name is just kind of like throughout, uh, like setting and achieving goals. I found like one of the most important pieces to that is accountability. Uh, so any way you can set yourself accountable, uh, you do it. And uh, one of those ways is like to tell friends, to tell people about your goal, um, or in my case, to make my username that goal and tell the entire world all at once. Um, because I think I would feel pretty dumb if I didn't win and this was my username. So just a, a piece of accountability is the reason. Uh, for the name and uh yeah that's that's it so do you have a backup plan if you don't win this year or <laughs> it becomes 2025 what are you going to be called then there is no backup plan i have to win nice <laughs> uh so you get legend on all three servers and you maintain your ranks pretty well um why is going for triple legend your focus instead of just trying to maintain the rank on just one server? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. I think it's one that doesn't have a fantastic answer. Um, 
this current system or the last system rewarded having three servers in the sense that you could grind one up to top legend and uh, you could just kind of camp that rank out and then you could go grind the other servers at the same time. So having high MMR on three servers is is pretty heavily rewarded in the way the system exists. Um, but that being said, if you're not already in the top hundred, uh, it begs the question of like, why, why don't you just get one, you know, one server into the top hundred and then focus on these other ones. And, uh, that's, you know, basically what I'm doing this season. I worked with a coach a little bit. Um, and that was the determination we came to is like, Hey, you should probably focus on one server until you're there, until you're that guy. And then, and then you can start focusing on these other servers. So yeah, great question. And, uh, working on the answer. (laughs) If, if you can, who's your coach? Uh, Janos. Janos, uh, I don't know if you guys know who Janos is. He's uh, basically a phenom back in 2016, I believe, as far as Hearthstone mm-hmm. went, before my time. Mm-hmm. So I didn't really know who he was, but I uh, just kind of ran into him on Twitch and he jumped in and he said, you know, I could teach you a lot on live on stream. And he jumped into a Discord call and basically did a, a live free coaching session. And then I hired him for a few more sessions after that. And uh, yeah, we've been working yeah. together. That's mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah. Um. So... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, yeah, you're you're only as good as you know the the people that surround you. So just trying mm-hmm. to keep pulling people in as much as I can. I need help. <laughs> uh, so what led you to uh, streaming full time? Yeah, I, uh, so th- this journey starts uh, for Hearthstone with me writing a, a blog that almost nobody knows about, uh, but I wrote a huge blog about how I was going to achieve this goal, and through writing that blog. Um, I just kind of mapped out what I needed to do. And it actually began with like collecting all the cards and things like that, like very simple things. And then starting to play more and learning how to play better. Um, But yeah, so I I write out this blog. And then after that, uh, I watched a Lorinda stream. Uh, I'm sure you guys know who Lorinda is. I watched a Lorinda stream and McBanterface was in the chat coaching Lorinda um, through his gameplay on, I think it was Relic Demon Hunter or something. And at that moment, I realized... I need to stream because this is the best way for me to crowdsource my learning. And I'm so far behind uh, these top players. So that's, that's how streaming started. Nice. Um, so you've built, uh, you've built up a following pretty fast for someone who's been within the Hearthstone scene for as long or as short of a time frame that you've been in, um, which it's not a super easy thing to do. So what's your, what, what do you think your secret sauce is? Uh, just being really lucky. <laughs> it, it seems like that's really what happened because I just turned on the camera and I did my thing. Uh, the only way I knew how to do it, I didn't even have much experience watching, uh, streams on Twitch and stuff like that. But, uh, the massive generosity from the Hearthstone community, um, getting hit with a Lorinda raid almost immediately, which is super ironic and fantastic for me being, that was the reason I started streaming. Then Norwis, then Tice, McBanterface, like all of these guys just, being so generous, like through rating and stuff like that, um, really increased the audience very quickly. Uh, so yeah, I would say mostly luck. <laughs> nice. So luck can happen, people. It, it can, <laughs> yeah. But generosity too, right? From the Hearthstone community, yeah. it's an awesome community. Um, it's so cool to be a part of. Yeah, glad you're in it. Uh, so, so what is your plan if there is no Hearthstone esports in 2024, or if there are? Um, what if you don't win at all? Do you plan on trying to do it in 2025? Um, yeah, I, uh, I could dive in pretty far here, but I'll keep it relatively short, I guess. Um, basically, I put my whole life on, on the side to complete this goal. Uh, so if it doesn't happen, if there is no system, uh, I'm going to be in a bit of a pinch. It's going to be time to, to go back to school, um, you know, get a job, all that stuff uh, is probably going to need to happen if there is no system this year and if I don't win it. Um, but as far as this year goes, if there is no system, I plan to compete in like community tournaments, stuff like that. It's only, you know, there's still thousands of dollars out there um, that you can compete for even without the Masters Tour system. Uh, if you're willing to, you know, go to these different, you know, Mobius, um, there's like an OCS uh, system. There's, uh, the community gaming system. There, there are thousands of dollars out there. So that would be my backup plan is to compete in those. And if I don't win it, um, I haven't thought that far. It's just the plan okay. is to win. <laughs> now, now you've been playing, I, I've, I watch you a lot during the day and, um, you play a lot on ladder. 
have you played much tournaments? Have you gotten into some of these that, things that you've been talking about? Because that that's a, that is a different meta and a different experience than just playing on the ladder. Yeah, it's it's an awesome question. It's a huge thought in my head. And actually, uh, just today, we cut the stream short so I could map out a few tournaments that I'll compete in this week, including one that you've tagged me in. Um, but yeah, it's it depends on the system, right? If if the system is through ladder, then the, my main focus needs to be ladder. And then I can try to like cram for the tournament, essentially. But I got to make sure I get there. So it's like, if the system is just like going to be one of those big uh, qualifier tournaments that you guys used to have, then I need to be working on tournaments. So right now I'm trying to like split my time and trying to figure out, uh, you know, where the priority sits. Um, so I'm mostly focused on ladder, but going to start sprinkling in tournaments because I feel that the later the esports announcement comes, the less likely it is to have more to do with ladder. And uh, yeah, so I'm just kind of trying to prepare for both. That's that's kind of been my mindset right now. And the tournament that he was just talking about is the Hype Horizon return of, uh, we're going to do Friday Night Hype now, and that's on January 19th at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or Eastern Daylight Time. I get those confused. So if you are looking for a tournament and you want to go head-to-head with Masters Champion MTC yourself, sign up for it. It's free, and there's some prizes. Yeah, Um, excited. Yep. Uh, So... You did mention Lorinda and a couple other streamers. <laughs> Do you have any like favorite streamers other than Lorinda that inspired you? Or is Lorinda like the the big pinnacle one? Um, yeah, I would say like Lorinda was the spark for my reason to stream. But as far as like streamers uh, who I watch the most, um, I like I like McBanterface a lot. I think he explains his plays really well for a high level player. Um, and I don't think a lot of high level players, they are so far above and beyond in terms of skill that they can just glance over very simple decisions and things like that. Um, and, uh, so McBanterface, I really enjoy, uh, as far as watching and then Ron Mexico, I I love Ron Mexico. He's just so relaxed. Um, I like his positive approach to the game. So those would probably be my two, like, if I could try to like fit, if I would try to like model my stream after a couple of other streamers, it would be probably those two. I like the mentality of Ron Mexico and then the analytics of both Ron Mexico and McBanterface. And Ron has fantastic hair. And I <laughs> wish I had that hair. Uh, so what is your favorite class? Uh, do you guys want to try and guess? I guess doc, you don't know me that well, but Tito, would you like to try and guess? <sighs> I know it's not Druid, even though that's what you've been playing constantly. Uh-huh. Um, and I don't think it's Rogue either. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it's Mage. Okay. Um, I'm still going to guess. Um, I'm going to say uh, Warrior. Good guess is uh, just Demon Hunter, and it's, it's not close either. Ah! <laughs> I, I have never seen you play one game of Demon Hunter. Yeah, I play what's good, but uh, if... If I could, if it was up to me, I would be the J. Alexander of Demon Hunter. I would just play Demon Hunter all the time. If I didn't like care about rank necessarily or what the meta was, I love the class so much. I think you mean I'd be the J. Alexander, but I'd be positive. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, so Demon Hunter is your favorite class. Mm-hmm. What is your favorite deck? This is a tough question. Um... I'm probably known at this point for Enrage Warrior the most, but ironically, I didn't overly love the deck. Um, it just worked really well. I would say probably Relic Demon Hunter back when we had Bran, Jace. Um, yeah, all the good stuff, the hero card. Nice. Okay. Um, so Hearthstone is a game of many modes. We know you play Standard quite a bit. Do you play any of the other modes in, sta- in Hearthstone? I do not. I probably have five arena runs. Total. Um, never played duels, which is now disappearing. So maybe I will try it once. Uh, but yeah, I'm, and I've played probably a total of five games of Wild uh, with a against a friend in a friendly match. Okay. And is that just because you're you're wanting to focus so hard on achieving the MT champion? for 2024 uh that's the reason or have they just never tickled your fancy yeah yeah, I, yeah that was exactly what i was gonna say is that's the reason now but i actually started out playing battlegrounds uh basically when quillbore were introduced and okay. it was boring to me i didn't like it i didn't like how 
you had long turns in the beginning and then really fast turns at the end where you almost had to like APM things. And then I also didn't like that you couldn't select your cards. And I didn't like that I couldn't pick where my minions attacked. And then I found standard and I was like, oh, this is this is everything I I wanted to fix about <laughs> Battlegrounds. I'll play standard. So yeah, I just fell in love with standard, the game mode. Nice. Um, so what is an interesting fact people uh w- that you think might like uh to hear from you about yourself um yeah i think probably something that makes me unique is that i move a lot i basically i've never stayed put for more than three years and most of my moves are every single year i move to a different state country location uh whatever i move a lot it's like ingrained in me at this point uh and i've been to 18 different countries as well i just look kind of oh, a wow. nomad i guess <laughs> Well, some of that came, so you are military, so um, a lot of that probably derived from that, right? Yeah, yeah, I was a military brat growing up, so I changed schools every year, and then as an adult, I guess it just stuck with me. I, I get an itch every couple of years where I'm like, I gotta go, I gotta go somewhere new. Well, now that we've got to know MTC a little bit better, um, Doc, you weren't here last week when me and Sheep talked about New Year's resolutions, so um, I think we need to talk about New Year's resolutions for you guys. So, uh, what resol- So, what goals from last year did you have, and how did they do? Doc, why don't you start? Uh, yeah, so I'm pretty sure I had Reach Diamond as my goal, and that did not happen at all. Because I would, on the months where I would feel like I would really grind for my engagement of Hearthstone the last year, I would feel burnt out. I like platinum five because I wouldn't have any star bonus left. So then it like would truly become like a super big slog to even try to get close to like what I really wanted to do for my goal. Um, And so then I would just switch and probably play like TFT or battlegrounds. All right. How about yourself, MTC? Um, As far as like a hearthstone goal uh, last year. Yeah. Yeah. I I guess, yeah, I, my goal last year was just like I kind of made it towards the end of the year and it was to uh, to start ramping up for this. So uh, it was just basically to get into Legend. And I think my end of year goal was to get an 11 star bonus on all three servers. And uh, I ended up hitting rank 88 on Asia. And um, I finished, I think, rank 235 on Europe. So I exceeded the goal. I was pretty stoked about that. Heck yeah. Nice. So how about short term goals for this year? So. We, we obviously we know we have long term goals. Doc is still diamond, and um, Masters Tour champion is going to try to win the whole damn thing. So those are some goals that we already know. What about for the like next couple months? What are your goals? Um, to feel more engaged with Hearthstone. Um, I very much dislike six sets metas. Um, I've never like enjoyed playing them. Um, so finding a way to find the fun again in Hearthstone, um, is probably going to be like priority number one, uh, cause I haven't enjoyed playing Hearthstone since shortly after, um, Badlands came out. Um, but yeah, just fi- finding the fun again, um, whether that's before or after the mini set, which I believe we'll get an announcement next week, maybe since we had the heroic tavern brawl. Um, cause those two kind of coincide, uh, pretty regularly. Um, and then once I start playing more often again, um, to just try to like every month to try to increase my star bonus by one, I feel like it's a good short term goal. And, and I think that by next podcast, we should have the entire mini set announced and it will be released a couple days after that's how it usually goes. They do the mini set, um, announcements real fast. So I don't think they're going to tell us Tuesday or Thursday, but they're going to tell us one of those days and it's just going to blitz out and, and we'll have some good new cards to talk about. Yep. Um, and MTC, I think we already know your goals, but if you want to just go over that, what are, you, what are your goals for the year? Yeah. I mean, obviously take the whole thing home. Um, and then the short term goals are going to depend on the announcement, of course, but I think a good short term goal uh, for this month is to finish top hundred on a server. If there is not an announcement and then if there is one, That'll change the goal. How about you, Tito? Uh, I already talked about mine last week, but um, thank you. That's a great segue. You're here. You're starting to get your, you're starting to learn how to podcast already. It's great. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) No, uh, so I, my, my goals is just to get more consistent. So I actually, and and everyone that listened and already heard me say this last week, but um, my long-term goal here is to just 
10 out of the next 12 months, I want to have a lower legend rank than I did the month before. Um, so I had been kind of focused on trying to get to become 11 stars and I'm not quite there yet. And I don't want to, I don't need to get to 11 stars. I need to be an 11 star player. I want to be a person that gets up there and you play and, and just end the month and you know, it is what it is. And there I am and I'm moving on. That's going to take yeah. a bit more skill. So for now, I just want to like, if I hit this month, if I hit 5,000, then next month, if I hit 4,999 or lower, then it's a win. And, and that's kind of what I'm going for. Um, Love it. And and one thing I think that could help me um, is learning how to break down my games better. And that's our main topic for today. So one thing that MTC does on his streams quite often is he is always in the replays. And I usually, he streams during the day. I'm usually working, so I'm on work calls. But I have him up on a, a separate monitor uh, and I'm watching. And most of the time it seems like the replay screen is open almost as much as the game screen. So um, MTC, like I said, a lot of times you're, uh, a lot of your stream is reviewing games almost as much as you're playing. Um, how did you decide to make that such a big part of your play and streaming experience? Yeah, I, first of all, I would say it's more than I play. Uh, so that's definitely accurate. Um, I think we've definitely spent more time in the replay and analyzing the gameplays than we do playing on those streams. Um, but... I don't know. I just like always with setting goals. My first step is to break things down into like manageable chunks and uh, find ways to objectively answer questions. Like if this is working, if this is not um, And the replay function of Hearthstone, is just so fantastic for that uh, through HS replay. Uh, it's incredible that you can sit there with infinite time and look at infinite different realms and, you know, worlds where things that could have happened. Um, so it's just, it's, it's so good to be able to sit there with all the time in the world. Uh, I'm a believer that a computer could be taught the game of Hearthstone and play better than everybody. Uh, if it could run the odds on every single situation that could exist, uh, the hand odds of the opposing player, the kept cards, I think you could figure it out. I think each turn is solvable. I don't think every game is winnable, but I think each turn is solvable. Um, so through going through these replays, I try to get, yeah, basically the goal of it is just to um, figure out how to get get to the best answer faster. Um, already do the math on the pools. I've studied the uh, the Cactus Construct pool relentlessly. I know there's 71 cards. I know how many of them I want. I know how many are trash. Um, I know how many apply to my deck. I know how many are good situationally. I know the odds of getting those. Um, and through that, I know whether opening Cactus Construct on the beginning of a turn is a good idea or not, depending on what I'm looking for and uh, what the odds are of getting that. So just like things like that, uh, I love to go through, and I think they make me a better player. So when you're doing this, when I see you, you also have spreadsheets and, and you talk about this relentlessly. So what is your process and how does this help improve your game? Uh, yeah, so the process is to go through the replay, look through every decision, and basically uh, you need to decide whether there's an objective answer, yes or no, uh, if this was correct or incorrect. If it's a 50-50, then it's a 50-50, right? You make play-style decisions. But anyways, I break down in a spreadsheet um, each game. So it'll be win or loss, yes or no, right? Did I win or did I lose? Uh, was the matchup favorable or not? Um, yes or no. And the reason you're tracking that is because if you're playing unfavorable matchups, you're playing extremely well, you know, you need to switch decks. It's an objective answer to that question. Um, and then I have all of the different mistakes you can make in a game kind of broken down by category. So I have no mistakes in a column. I have a decision-making error in a column. I have fundamental errors, which would be things like drawing last, etc. Um, I have game losing errors, which is where basically you've, you've made a, an error in the game that caused you to lose the game within the next couple of turns and then miss lethals. And I just kind of mark each of those down through the spreadsheet and I'll just kind of track my gameplay as I go. And uh, it makes it really easy to know when to switch decks objectively. Uh, when you're playing terribly, when you're on tilt, it'll, you'll have a bunch of X's in the game losing mistake column. Um, when you're playing really well, but you're just losing games and you're getting high rolled, it'll be very easy to tell. And uh, it just helps take emotion out of Hearthstone. So I think that's uh, what allows me to be, you know, a better player is to detach from those emotions of winning and losing games. Great answer. So outside of your spreadsheets and reviewing of the games, what else are you doing to improve your game? Yeah, just uh, just playing a lot, talking to other people, uh, employ you know, hiring a coach. Um, and yeah, just practice, practice, practice. I study streams as well, watch my replays outside of the day, watch old replays as if they were somebody else's. 
Um, yeah, it's just uh, just a lot of studying, and uh, and then beyond, like outside of Hearthstone, uh, reading books about how to learn. You know, like literally learning how to learn. Um, there's a book called uh, Make It Stick, which teaches you how to learn things. You should pair things with other things that are similar. So I'll play sometimes like a game of chess or uh, a different game that like, you know, pickleball or something like that. Um, just other strategy minded games um, just to yeah, kind of stay sharp. But there is a poker book that uh, what's what's the what is the book? Do you know the name of it, Doc? Um, oh g- gosh, um, I did. You're talking, it's the, the mind games of poker or something along those I, lines. Yeah. Yeah. It's re- it, so the guy, the author was TSM's, uh, mental health coach. Okay. Uh, the mental game of poker. There we the go. Oh, game I've what it definitely is. heard of that. It's definitely been on my list before. I got to read that. Oh, I would, I would definitely, um, like bump that up a couple notches on your list because absolutely will do. that's been that's been a fantastic book i've listened to it uh twice i still want to own a physical copy so i can actually like take notes and highlight things um but like with most books like that the more like the more you read them and the more you digest them like the more like second or third level meet like messages you'll find yeah. and like find different like ways to take more information out of the book so yeah since you're already doing that kind of stuff, I would definitely add the mental game of poker. Absolutely, on and, we'll do. I th- and he was, I don't think he was on Coin Conceit. I think he was on the Angry Chicken. So there is a, um, I, I have to look for it, but I think he was on an episode of the Angry Chicken, which you might not know about because I, they might have shut down before you get there. Uh, at the Angry Chicken was one of the podcasts, uh, Hearthstone podcast, probably one of the longest running Hearthstone podcasts out there. So, okay. um, um, but he was on an episode of that and um, I believe. And I don't think it was coin. Like I said, I don't think it was coin conceit, but I might be wrong. We'll figure it out. I'll um, I'll let you know. But that's definitely it was. It was a great listen as well. Yeah, um, I love that info. Do you play chess? Uh, I did as a kid against my father. Um, never like seriously or overly competitively. Just wanted to beat my dad all the time. Um, yeah, so I, I know nice. how to play the game. I know how to be good enough to beat my dad, and then uh, that's about it. <laughs> well, it's just like your approach to this is kind of like how people study chess matchups and and openings and and all the different things like oh did you see the kraspowski 387 uh whatever so um you know it, it's just interesting i thought you might have been a chess player but um all right so you're looking at these you're you're doing your replays sometimes it's not black and right if you made a wrong play or a right play or if you made a good play right. if there's a better play it's not it's sometimes it's very clear like oh i'm a dummy i should have uh, he, I, like I like the other night, I should have used uh funnel cake on my opponent's already healed minions to get three mana versus my two minions and only get two mana. And sometimes there's clear mistakes, but a lot of times it's ambiguous or it's it's hard to track down. So how do you make these decisions on if hey I made a wrong play or a right play or a good play or a better play? How how do you do that? Yeah, yeah, it's super hard, right? Because sometimes just like you said, it's like either decision would have been fine in a, in a scenario. Um, I think one thing you can do, and you need to be careful with this, is you can use hindsight, right? You can look at, oh, what cards did I draw if I would have drawn? You know what I mean? What were my next two cards? What would they have been? Um, or, you know, even if you don't, like that's saying you could have drawn in a turn. You could have spent two mana to draw, but if you spent that two mana, you closed off another option to yourself, right? Like things like that, you can use hindsight, which is a dangerous tool because you don't have access to that when you're playing the game, right? You can't know, but you can start running the odds on those things, right? I could have drawn two cards. These two cards saved me. My percentage of pulling them were this. Uh, I could have discovered this. Um, and my odds of discovering that card that I needed were X percentage. Um, so you can you could try to run the numbers into it. Uh, but if it's something that relies on your opponent, what they had, what they were doing, et cetera, uh, it gets very difficult to do that. And I think some of those games, um, they go down into my column that I said, decision-making errors, right? Uh, if I made a decision-making error, it's just, you know, I, a play style thing. I play more aggressively than a lot of players. Um, some players play less aggressively than others. And uh, you just have to mark that down as a play style error, potentially, or just like, hey, my play style caused me to, you know, make a decision that didn't turn out to be right. And evaluate those over a long period of time of like, oh, okay, if I play a little more aggressively, maybe I could win more. But very tough, like you're saying. It's not always objective. But it's and it's also there's a difference between being uh, results oriented and um, 
I forget the other word, but it's like you could have made you could have made the right decision and it still ended up being the wrong move in that particular case. Like if you could have said, hey, I, I decided to play this card. And then if you had played a different card, the card you drew would have made the difference. But nine times out of ten, you made the right play. So where does that kind of fit into all this for you? Yeah, I mean, I could nerd out on this forever. I love this conversation. Um, and I That's why you're here. Love these questions. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I love these questions. Yeah. So analyzing your wins is uh, way more important than analyzing your losses uh, because you can really realize when you're playing like crap um, through analyzing your wins and you're getting lucky and you're winning. You need to recognize that uh, because that is the easiest way to become. Uh, to hit a plateau and become a bad player uh, is if you just, you know, you're playing the deck the same way, it gets you to a certain rank, but then all of a sudden you get tougher opponents and those plays don't work for you. That's what a lot of players, I think, will say, I'm unlucky or it's just matchups, it's just RNG um, and it's super dangerous. You need to analyze your wins a lot more. But um, sorry, I kind of tracked off of the original question. What was it? It's just sometimes like you could have made a play that, lost you like say you make a play and then you lose the game and if you would have made a different play you would have won but the play you made even though you lost is the right play i mean that can happen right because even though it failed in that particular scenario statistically making that play is the better play so how do you even evaluate that yeah yeah that's so that one's that's great i do that all the time uh it's what it looks like on my spreadsheet is you know, this is the matchup. It was favorable. Uh, win or loss, I lost. And then mistakes made, none, right? I made no mistakes. And if I can objectively say that that was the right decision in nine out of those 10 games by running, you know, the odds on all the other situations that could have happened, um, using all the information I had at that moment in time about my opponent's hand, um, that's a perfectly played game. And I love those, you know? I love taking a loss when, uh, when there's nothing I could have done to win uh, that was better. No, no. So I think I think a, a trap that you could fall into is kind of what I'm talking about. Is like, so I make a play that was the wrong play, but it ended up panning out for me, and I won that game. So then, um, that becomes kind of um, ingrained in me, like, oh, I did that and I won, but I should have done mm-hmm. the other thing. So it's just interesting. Like, you can, how how do you decide that? And a lot of it is just kind of, I guess, the aggregate of playing these things over and over again, and and just really breaking it down. Because I think that it's very easy to fall into patterns of. This worked before, it should work now, but no, it should have been the other play or the other play, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's just, you know, like kind of what my first rant was about was just like, um, you just have to run the numbers on things and know what the likelihood of that actually happening were or was. Um, but it, like you said, there's some situations that it was equal odds or you had to you had to read on your opponent because they picked something fast through Discover that maybe they had something better than, you know, what their odds would have suggested. And there are certain nuances, but yeah, just try to be as objective as possible. Know your odds um, and then know if you're making the right plays or not. And just be twice as critical on yourself for your wins as you are on your losses, probably. Uh, because like you said, you could get into a trap. You're like, oh, this works. This won me games. Um, but if the odds weren't there, then that's not going to work in the top 100, right? Right. But so what would you say you're looking for when you when you're looking at your wins? Like... You're not trying to find out how to win more, right? You're trying to like what? What is? What are you trying to zero in on on those victories when you're when you're evaluating those? Yeah, I mean, on my victories, the the biggest things I'm looking for are where where was I at tempo wise generally in the game. Um, I play mostly like tempo style decks, so it depends on what deck you're playing too, right? Of course, but um, mostly with my wins, like the biggest thing I'm analyzing is where did I give my opponent room to breathe. Uh, where was the three turn lethal setup? Like, where did I see lethal three turns out, or did I see it three turns out? And if I didn't, um, where did I need to make trades or not make trades to potentially close this game out a turn early? Like, did was there a turn where my opponent had three health? Okay, how could I have done three damage earlier? Okay, was it worth doing that three damage earlier? No, I made value trades on the board. That's what allowed me to push extra damage. Okay, the answer is no, I didn't make a mistake. Or oh, I made a crappy trade into a minion that they had to trade into a taunt anyway. That cost me three damage. It extended the game a turn. Now, potentially, they could get back into this game. Uh, but that's primarily what that looks like. It's just like, could I found a, a way to close this game out earlier? Could I have found a way to, uh, yeah, set up lethal? And, and why didn't I see lethal, you know, three turns out, four turns out, uh, even though it's hard to do? So this is not a question that's on here on the list I gave you, but um, how often do you bottom right? Like, when do you when do you decide to concede out of a game? 
Uh, it's pretty rare. Um, I will if Lethal is showing, for sure. Um, and if it's going to be a game that's going to take longer than my next three games or two games, uh, then I'm going to go ahead and get out of that game. So if I'm against a Control Priest, I have no tempo. I have one absolute prayer of a win condition. Like, say with Dragon Druid, I need to discover two Dragon Walls off of amalgams and then maybe i can get back into it or i can you know i can spend 40 minutes doing that or i could just get out of this game and, and play three more in that time with a 60 percent win rate uh you know so just there's some min maxing but uh if it's if it's a you know a different matchup that's going to be over soon anyway i i'm never conceding it fair enough and i i, I think i do a lot of that too so i mean I, I will concede occasionally but for the most part unless i have played to my last out like i, I I'll, I'll look and say hey uh, what can I do here? Like, I look at my remaining cards. I'm like, I have no generation left. There's no way I'm going to come back here. Then I'll, I'll bottom mm-hmm. right. But for the most part, I, I try to stick it out, usually to my detriment. Uh, <laughs> all right. For what it's worth, you know, not to not to enforce what might be a bad habit for us, but I did play a 42 con- minute control priest mirror, uh, which I had absolutely nothing. Where my opponent disconnected at the end, and I won a 42 minute game <laughs> with with but, absolutely like three cards. <laughs> but did you really win? <laughs> that is the most fair question. <laughs> Nobody won. All right. So now you've broken down your games and like, okay, I just went over this game. I broke it down and you go back to playing and it might be a while before you see the situation that you just, you know, maybe you saw something that happened in uh, a Druid versus Paladin matchup. Like, oh, I should, I should probably try to focus more on this, but you're not going to see it for a while. So how mm-hmm. do you translate what you learn into the reviews in the reviews to actually something that you apply in game? Yeah, it's it's another awesome question. Um yeah, it's it's very hard to do, right? Because like you said, you won't see that exact situation for potentially a hundred more games. Um but just putting that attention to detail in it, uh it subconsciously gets you there. Um like the same thing happened to me over and over. My biggest piece of growth uh recently has been just making sure I'm setting up lethals, um, even when it's obvious. I used to like conceal a lot more, like don't put my opponent to eight health. Like I would build a board instead of just blatantly putting my opponent to eight health with Alex Straza in hand, um, because I would want to kind of conceal that I have lethal or whatever. I didn't want it to be so obvious. And recently I've learned just put them to eight health. They can know what's going on, but the chances that they can heal and clear my board and play around Alex Straza, it, it's unlikely. So uh, that happened to me over and over and over where it's like I didn't set up the two turn lethal, you know, X amount of times in a row. Uh, so, yeah, that was just like that when something happens over and over, you see it on the checklist over and over. You start to realize, OK, this is something to focus on. And other ones, you make the same mistake, you know, 15 times and eventually you figure it out. Yeah. So one thing I always run into is the decision on when you go all in and it's not lethal. So when you have an opportunity and it seems to always backfire but it, you're supposed to do it, right? So if, like, you can get your opponent down to, like, two health, and mm-hmm. this is your chance to put that damage in before that uh, next Reno or whatever it might be, um, Sandstorm or, or whatever it could be, like, yeah. when do you, like, uh, how do you feel about that it's a particular kind of situation? I guess it depends on game to game and what you're playing and stuff like that, but I think a lot of times you, most players tend to say, well, I don't have lethal this turn, so I'm not going to make the plays or I'm not going to develop or I'm not going to do what I think I can do. I'm going to wait another turn or another turn until I do it. But what are your thoughts about in Let's just knock them down to two and then see if they have the ability to get back or not. Yeah, of course it matters. Like you said, uh, what the matchup is. But um, generally, I think the biggest question in your head at that moment in the game needs to be, is this game better for me if it goes longer or is it worse for me if it goes longer? And if it's worse for you, then it's probably just best to make that move and hope for the best, right? Um, Put it all out there, hope for the best. Now, if the game gets better for you as it goes longer, that's probably not the right call, right? Let's just kind of slowly and steadily kind of build up momentum, keep tempo on the board. Um, And again, like, you know, I'm playing a control deck with board clears. Well, I probably need to hold a minion back. So it is circumstantial, but I think generally uh, it's probably the right thing to do. If you're in that situation, you're probably the more aggressive deck. You're probably lower on value. Um, it's it's probably just the right thing to do and hope for the best. And when you lose, you can't look back at that and say, that was wrong. I made the wrong decision because I lost that game. It's like, no, you, you would have lost that game five turns later uh, against the control priest if you didn't do it. 
And actually, that's um, one of the topics we're going to have. We're having Ron Mexico on back. I mentioned that. But we're going to be talking about kind of, hey, in this matchup, even though I'm a slower deck, I need to be more aggressive. Or, or even though I'm more of an aggressive deck because I'm playing maybe a more aggressive deck, I need to play more like a control deck. And how to kind of figure that kind of stuff out. So we'll be talking about that pretty soon, uh, which I think is going to be an exciting topic. But um, yeah. all right. So you have any other advice for someone that wants to improve their game by evaluating their replays and their, their, their former games? Yeah. I, uh, I have people ask this question, uh, at the stream all the time and it's one of the easiest pieces of advice to give. And it almost works every single time. Actually, it, nobody has said it doesn't work for them. Um, play it till you lose, take a break after you lose, watch your replay and just hang out for a little bit, do some push ups. do something else get back to ladder, right? If you do that three times and you come back and you lose, you come back and you lose. Um, and basically all I'm doing with that piece of advice is just avoiding tilt. Um, even if you just play the exact same way, uh, you only play till you lose. You essentially create a reward system in your brain uh, where you can, you're, you're motivated to win. You're always looking to win. And when you tilt, you're almost motivated to lose. I know that sounds funny, but uh, you're looking for ways to lose when you're tilted, right? You're like, oh, they're going to get this. They're going to get this. And you almost play to lose, you know? Fair enough. And I think another thing we could probably add, this this doesn't quite uh, work for you because you're streaming, but because this is happening naturally with your chat. But um, review your games with other people. Like, have other people look at your, your, your replays because... I, like I'm on a team for THL and we go over each other's replays and say, Oh, on turn three, you could have done X, Y, or Z, or uh, I would have made this play instead. And, and it makes you really kind of think when you have someone else looking at what you're doing and just bringing that fresh perspective, because you can look at something for a while and you may not see the matrix and, and they see exactly what the opposite play you should have made. So just something to think about. Um, Absolutely. All right. So um, any final thoughts? uh that's that's it for me i just really appreciate you guys having me on here i got to just be a nerd for a little bit talk about my <laughs> spreadsheets and uh that's couldn't ask for anything better oh i meant final thoughts on the topic we'll get back to the rest of that later oh, um doc, oh, gotcha i thought we were wrapping up <laughs> oh no we're getting there but doc how about yourself any final thoughts on breaking down your games um i mean no um mtc has come at this from a very if you couldn't tell very analytical perspective um, and is able to find all the data um, that you need to actually break down your game. So listeners, if this is something you want to do, feel free to listen to this and just make those spreadsheets yourself for your own for your own gameplay. Um, I can't I don't feel like I can add anything of value to the topic that uh, MTC hasn't already covered. So you hit up Mark. <laughs> And if you want to see kind of what he does with his spreadsheets and how he breaks down games and how he plays, uh, you can catch him on stream. He's streaming. He streams most of the day between, uh, I think, like nine, eight, eight or nine to like four or five. I mean, you, you kind of vary a little bit when your time's in, but you're always out there and you're always doing the same thing. So, yes, um, so um, Doc, that was a lot of information and I'm kind of full, but I think there's room for dessert. What about you think? Yeah, I think dessert sounds nice. So, MTC, what is your favorite dessert? Yeah, so after making a spreadsheet of all the desserts and ranking them, <laughs> <laughs> nah, German chocolate cake for sure. Heck yeah. <laughs> I I kind of want you to make a spreadsheet of how to ju- how to critique desserts now, though. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> what about you guys? <laughs> Uh, yeah. So for me, um, I really like peach cobbler. Oh yeah. Solid. And I'm a tiramisu kind of guy. Oh yeah. Can't go wrong. Yeah. So listeners, um, if you would be so inclined, please leave us a review. Uh, we'd prefer five stars cause that's what ultimately helps with visibility. Um, but give us an honest rating for however you feel like, uh, you feel how the show's going. Uh, give us the good, bad, the ugly, because we want to make this show uh, what we want it to be. But we also want to make it as good as what you want the show to be as well. And if you leave us a review or an email, we will read it out on the show. Uh, so, MTC, where can people find you on social media? Um, yeah, mostly just on Twitch. It's twitch.tv slash Masters Tour Champion 2024. And uh, yeah, if you're. Fingers aren't sore from typing that. You could also check out uh, the Twitter <laughs> or X, and it's just uh, 
MT Champion 24 on uh, on Twitter. Nice. How about yourself, Doc? Uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Doc McButt. And whenever I fix my computer, <laughs> you will be able to find me on Twitch at Doc McButt. And yourself, Tito? You can find me on Twitter and Twitch at Tito Santana HS. You can also find the show at Bread and Bread Butter HS on Twitter. And if you have anybody that you'd like to see on the show or you have a topic you'd like us to talk about or maybe revisit, let us know. And uh, we'll definitely work it in there. Um, how about any shout outs? MTC, you're going to want to shout out this week. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, Coach Shanos, uh, we'll, we'll give him a shout. He's helped me a lot uh, along this journey. And uh, he's, you know, always working as a coach. So if you're looking to improve your game, for sure. And then just a huge thank you to, uh, you know, Tice, Norwest, McBanterface, uh, Lorenda, all those guys who have rated the channel early on. Uh, Tito, for your endless support. Doc, it's been great to meet you. Uh, yeah, it's been fun. Having me on the too. show. Thank you guys so much. And Doc, how about yourself? Uh, yeah, I just want to, I want to shout out my niece and my sister for being such amazing people. Um, I had an absolute blast getting to see them again and it's fun to see my sister be a mom, you know, like it's just fun to (laughs) see someone fall in love with something like that and just do so well at it. Um, and my niece is just the most adorable little girl and if any singular force could get me to move back to the Pacific Northwest, um, it'd probably be her. And how about yourself, Tito? Uh, I'm going to shout out Ron Mexico. We've said his name quite a bit the show. Uh, but I So I played him this week, and I had a little fun with him. I made a little wrestling promo, which was a lot of fun, calling him out, <laughs> so even though good. I basically, even though I said basically that he was going to beat me and um, whatever. But it was a lot of fun. And the best part about the game was after um, the games, we actually – in the spirit of the show, we took the replays and we went through um, each game and we talked about it on stream and went over things where he thought I made some mistakes, where he thought he made some mistakes, uh, which were very few. And um, where he's like, I thought you had me here and I had a concern and then I drew the nuts here and all that. So it was a real lot of fun. Um, and I also like to thank ETC, Electric Sheep. I always call them ETC, E. SC Electric Sheep City and for filling in last week and it's always a blast talking to him but I think we're toast we'll see ya bye bye see ya slide two brothers meet one another when they slide up to the mic It's bread and butter with one another. Let's start up that recording light.